Thank you for tuning in once again to This is Della Cruz. This video is brought to you by Guitar Center Professional. I know you've heard of Guitar Center. GC Pro is nationwide with professional pricing. Hit them up, link in bio. I'm literally gonna put Greg Glazer's number below. Go ahead and hit him up. Text them, go ahead. Sitting since 2003. Are we ready to roll? Oh, That's what yeah, we're gonna we're call rolling. it. <laughs> we're here with Brad Divins. Brad Divins is front of house for a band called Disturbed. Is that the only one? And also Enrique Iglesias. That's what a contrast. It's a, it's quite the contrast. Which one's your favorite? Put it on camera right now. It all depends. <laughs> they're they're both my favorite for different reasons. Explain. Disturbed is a loud rock band, in your face, aggressive, with fire and really cool lighting. And Enrique is you go to all different types of interesting places, yeah. play for large crowds, and it's still a rock band, but with Enrique singing. What I honestly thought was so impressive when I learned that about you was there's a lot of engineers that kind of pigeonhole themselves into one genre and have a tough time getting outside of that. And, it, and I think it's kind of a testament to you and your career that you do two different genres for it. And it keeps you, I'm assuming, very diverse and kind of keeps you on your chops when yeah. you're not just getting stuck with doing rock and roll. Exactly. Well, and I mean, going back to, you know, when I first started out, there was a time when I had just finished the Lincoln Park tour and the tour, I'm sorry, I had just finished, yes, Lincoln Park and then I went to Cindy Lauper. And then I got called to do a one-off for Counting Crows. And the <laughs> tour manager says, well, what have you done? And I said, well, I did Lincoln Park and I just finished Cindy Lauper. He's like, Cindy Lauper? Lincoln Park? Well, that's a far cry from Counting Crows. I'm like, yeah. And Cindy Lauper is a far cry from Lincoln Park. But it's just music. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Listen to the music, put it together. So what got you into doing running sound? I had to pay the rent. <laughs> that's it. I had to pay the rent. I was in LA. It was my last ditch effort as a, as a musician. The band like was signed. Like all of us, a failed musician. Exactly. The <laughs> band was signed. They said, hey, come to, come to L.A. We're going to do a record. I'm like, okay. Went to L.A., did the record. The record company said, we're not putting this out because we don't know what to do with it. And I'm like, oh, so now... They just shelved you? My rent was 600 Now it's 1200 uh. And I don't have any income. And my manager said, hey, there's a band looking for a tour manager. What do you think? Do you think you could tour manage? I'm like, oh, babysit grown men. <laughs> <laughs> I always took care of my band when yeah. we were on the road because we couldn't afford a guy. Yeah. So I went to meet the manager, and he's like, yeah, you know, you're going to be doing this, this, and this. Oh, and we need somebody to mix. Can you do that too? And I'm like, yeah, I can do that. And, I'm, and at that point, I'm like, what did I just say? What am I about so to do? So no experience? You just said yes? I had a little bit of experience sure. because of being a musician. I mean, yeah. you know, being in the studio. Working for you know working odd jobs with sound companies, you know paying the bills between tours and records and that sort of thing. I mean I knew I could do it, I just never done it on the level of there's a band doing second stage on Lollapalooza. You know there's yeah. the difference between a club and Lollapalooza. Yeah, no, no, but no. I was about to find out what it entailed, <laughs> and so I mean I just said yes at that moment. Do you remember the first show? Yeah, I remember the first show. 
vividly. Actually, how is the pucker factor probably well, real? <laughs> here's the thing: I'm the first. Show, there was supposed to be a show on the way to Lollapalooza in a club, and so the whole time I'm thinking, you know, I get a club gig to to figure this out and you know make mistakes or whatever. Well, the, we get into the club and the club gig gets canceled. And so I'm straight like, to Lollapalooza. I'm like, oh shit! I'm going straight to Lollapalooza now. So. We're at Lollapalooza, and I'm walking up to front of house, and I'm thinking, what am I going to say to this guy? Because I can't go up there and act like I know what I'm doing, because if I do, I'm going to fail. Yeah. And I don't want to fail. So I walk up to the guy, and I'm like, you know, hey, I'm Brad Divins. I'm tour manager, uh, front of house mixer for Agnes Gooch. That was the band. I said, but just so you know, I'm more of a tour manager than a front of house guy. But, you know, if you can show me around, I think I'll be okay. And he's like, sure. And that was it. It was like a big sigh of relief because I just came clean. Yeah. Being a musician, I knew what I wanted to hear. I just didn't, I didn't know how to get it. Nor when I looked at the console did I realize, oh, it's a, I think it was an XL, Midas XL 200. And so I'm, I'm walking up there and I see this big console and he's like, yeah, so here you go. Here's your input and here's your channel strip. And now you have whatever, 48 of them. I'm like, oh, okay. That was it. Started dialing up some gains, and away we went. And I had friends that were actually there that knew me from when I was in the band. And so they were all kind of cheering me on, and you know they were front of house guys. And they're like, yeah, you're doing all right. I'm like, cool. And I would ask questions and make mistakes, and I just figured it out. And you know, the whole time I was doing that, all, all I was ever thinking of is I'm just paying the rent. Because I'm going to get done with this tour. We're going to go back to L.A. I'm going to showcase. We're going to get signed again. I'm still going to be a rock star. Somehow, <laughs> some way, it's going to happen. But it never did. And people kept saying, hey, would you want to come mix my band? Or you want to come do this? And I'd just say yes to everything that was offered, no matter what it was. And that people kept calling. I'm like, and at one point, I was doing a band called Monster Magnet. Okay. And they were opening for, I think, Marilyn Manson and Hole. And I finally realized that, you know what, maybe this is where I'm supposed to be. Mm. Because it seemed like it was going well. I had spent countless years banging my head against the same wall trying to get somewhere as a musician. Yeah. Here I am just doing it to pay the bills and it seems to be working out. I'm not really, I mean, I'm trying, but I'm not, it's not my end, my goal. Yeah. It was never the plan. And I'm like, I think I'm just gonna see where this leads me. And it led me to, Lincoln Park and Garbage and Bob Seger and Jane's Addiction, Motley Crue and Enrique and Disturbed. I had no plan. And somehow, here I sit. Help me connect the dots from that to this current artist, to Disturbed. How'd you get connected with them? Uh, you mean from back then or from now? From now. Well, from, uh, so I've been doing Enrique for, I'm into my 10th year with him. Okay. And year before last, I'm sitting at my kitchen table and I'm like, you know, Enrique doesn't have a lot of shows. I feel like going out and mixing some people. Maybe let's just see what's out there. See if any of my front of house guys, my friends, have th some things that they can't do or know about. So I sent a couple of emails. And Greg Price emailed me back in like, I don't know, less than a minute. He said, hey Brad, you want to do Disturbed? I'm busy with Metallica. And I'm like, sure. And I came out and did the one-offs and like that was a year ago two years ago, okay. did all the one-offs, and then they were doing the tour last year, and Greg, was, of course, is still busy with Metallica, and this gig became mine, and so I just did it all last year. And, you know, then Enrique does his tour in the fall, and I did that, and now here I am doing this, and still doing Enrique, and awesome. so all that time spent in the rock world, Sure. you know, and then I end up doing Latino music, and now here I am in the rock world again. So here we are, we've got some great equipment here. Walk me through what you got. So you have an SXL here. Do you use this for all your gigs? No, this is actually the gig that, when Greg handed it over to me, this was the desk. Okay. So because I knew I was gonna be coming and going, that he or Brad Maddox might have to come fill in, I just kept it in S6. Got it. So, so here we are with the S6. And over here, I decided to add a whole bunch of analog goodness to can the... You, can you walk us through some of the... Uh, I can. can a rig rundown? I can. So we're going to start right here. Everything on my mix 
on the desk is bus to groups. Okay. Every input. Input wise, uh, it's it's I'm gonna say around forty eight or so. Okay. Tops. How many of those are drums? Drums are. Let's take a look and see. Drums, 16, 17, 18, and a reverb. Do you use triggers? There is a trigger on the kick and also on the snare. Triggers as gates or I'm sorry, samples. samples. Oh, okay. Yeah, samples. So no, no triggers as gates? No. Okay. No triggers as gates. Nope. So I wrestle with the gates a little bit when he hits, sure. you know, as you do. But yeah, no triggers for gates. Okay. So yeah, all the drums. So everything goes into groups. And then over here, all my groups come into the summing mixer. Okay. Drums, I got a parallel crush drum group, bass, guitar, some noisy bits here, David's vocal, a parallel vocal channel, and then background vocals. Okay. All the music is bust to stereo one, all the vocals to stereo two. Oh, cool. So now Smart. they come back in over here they come in down here. Okay. So now I have the band and I have vocals. These two inputs get busted left right. Okay. So on left right. Got it. Left right, we're going to start with the Portico 2 mix bus processor. From there, we're going to go into some GML, a little bit of EQ, into the Sonic Farm Cream Liner, and down here into the stereo imager by SPL. So we have a little bit of compression, some EQ, a little bit of saturation, followed by the imager. And that's for your... That's for left, right. That's, that's for your master bus. That's the entire, that's the master bus chain. All right, you got a fly gig that we got to go to. You can only take two. What do you Two. Take? I can only take two? You can only take two. I'm going to take master bus processor, and the Shelford channel for David's vocal. Okay. Okay. And the uh, RME is just your A to D? Yeah, the RME is the way that everything gets in and out of the desk. Okay. Um, tracks. Tracks, doing tracks? Tracks are, I'm going to say, like soundscapes, okay. explosions, different types of sonic sounds. Not necessarily, a little bit of guitar maybe, like music beds of things, okay. you know, as supplemental, as a supplemental bed. Okay. That's it. It's the, it's the band with some, a little bit of stuff slid underneath it. Do you do any uh, native um, effects? The effects are, the, the effects are actually waves, and I'm using... Oh, you are using waves, obviously. I'm yeah. using waves what? for the... Uh, the harmonizers, okay, and also the reverb, okay. Delays. So nothing on the board, just. Yeah, it's all in here, and the delays are McDSP. Okay. That's it, for the effects. Now let's. Uh, this is obviously a pretty large tour, and I'm assuming you have an SE that goes out with you. Mm -hmm. um, how involved are you with tuning the room? I let the SE do his thing, and then, and then I'll bring up some Pink Floyd. Okay. And then I'll bring up some tracks. Okay. Walk around a little bit, make sure that everything's good with front fills. That's what I was gonna ask. Are you, are you a peak noise? Are you a, uh, listen a, to a song? You I'm, wanna just talk to the mic? You know what? Or? I listen to the pink noise when Jim's doing it. Okay. You know, I, I hear the pink noise. I see what he's doing. I'm not the mad scientist behind the system engineering. Sure. I'm the musical mixer guy that I like to listen to things. And so that's why I bring up music that I'm familiar with. Yeah. Pink Floyd happens to be one of my favorites to the system. And then if it sounds really good, I might listen to three or four songs. And then I'll run tracks because okay. at the end of the day, that's what that's what the audience is gonna hear. Sure. Speaking of the system, what you what y'all rocking? This is Claire Claire Global's Cohesion, Co okay. 12. Co 12, Co 10 for side hangs, and the CP 218s for subs. Is this what you walked into or do you spec it or this is what was spec for this tour, yeah. Okay. Yep. How do you like it? I like it. Cool. It's present, it's in your face, and it's it's powerful. Okay. And it represents Disturbed quite well. I love it. Yeah. Um, what do you feel like are 
Uh, I have a lot of new engineers at Wax, just and obviously some some that are uh, experienced. What do you think is uh, some of the mistakes that newer engineers make that maybe took you a little bit to to learn? Uh, a couple things, I think. Uh, well, now that we're in a digital age, mixing with your eyes instead of your ears, thinking that oh, I can insert eight plugins on a channel strip. Yep. I think I will. Yeah. Well, maybe you should I was have listened. So guilty maybe of that. you should have listened to the source. And if the source sounds good and you're still not happy, maybe you should check where the microphone placement is. And if you're not happy with that, maybe you should make sure you're using the proper microphone. I've and noticed then, that. And then turn the input up. Nothing against people who use, nothing against you guys who use waves or plugins, but I've noticed with a lot of the newer engineers, uh, they, and I, I did this really, I started off in understanding signal flow and gain and how to use the board, and then I got into the plugin world for it. But I, I started off with analog. Remember, you have to tip the console on there and get your reverbs and your gauge, you exactly. to patch them all in there. But once I started, uh, I actually ended up quitting tour and got sober. Um, but when I got back into it, there was this big leap of, of digital, and it's fun to get into plugins, but I leaned very hard on that, and because I could, I, I did. Right. Um, and I see a lot of younger engineers just relying heavily on that, and then it's, um, uh, Wayne Pauly, I guess, put it really well, if, uh, waves crash. What happens when it exactly. crashes? Can you, can you do it without there? It's great of to have course. this out there, but I've noticed that a lot of the greats, the true greats, are really into source tone, and microphone, and you don't have to hack it out. No, you, you really don't. don't. No, because it's all about the source, and that's what I think people forget. It's about the source, the mic placement, and the microphone. And then it's also a choice of what console am I going to use, yeah. and how do I want to process my inputs. Yeah. You know, I mean, something else we didn't really talk about was there's processing for the group, the groups as well. Okay, so, explain. So, come down here to the drum group, which is inserted pre-fader. We have the drum kit, the parallel crush group. Okay. We got a bass group, which is seeing compression as well. Over here on the guitar is Rupert Neve 542 tape emulators, which are incredible on guitar, I mm. think. I mean, what's better than putting something through analog tape? So for the Rupert Neve designs, are you a red or blue person? I'm both. Okay. I don't know that I favor one more than the other. Okay. It depends on, depends on what I'm trying to get out of the source. Sure. With guitar, I'm trying to get a little bit of warmth and shave off just a little bit of the aggressiveness that comes with, you know, some heavy rock guitar. And I find it blue silk. And also the tape emulator just takes that, takes that bite, that bitey edge off okay. the guitars. For vocals, I'm going to go red silk. Because I want the presence in the upper mids and the top end. Yeah. Now on the band, I go with just a little bit of blue, just to give it a little bit of warmth and weight. And then on David's parallel vocal chain, I got a pair of distressors. Okay. Which I'm sure people are gonna say, "Oh, that's overkill." Hey, all my groups are in stereo, <laughs> so I got stereo inserts. Yeah. What am I gonna say? <laughs> you know. That's and that's that's the rundown. I mean, I already, we already mentioned that this is on David, the Shelford channel. Yeah. With the 545, I mean the 5045 to keep out the noise and the cymbal bleed and that sort of thing. What's your newest addition to, to it? The newest addition to this? Uh, not, I mean, I've been using it this way for, for a year now. Okay. So... I mean, I guess the newest addition that I did, because I was doing his parallel chain in here with plugins, but then at some point I'm like, I want to do it with distressors. Yeah. And so I ended up getting a pair of distressors and putting them on his, his vocal chain. And David's such a strong vocalist that here he is with the microphone and his fader, his VCA just, I mean, it's moving ever so slightly. With the parallel compression, it just pushes the vocal right up in the center of the mix. Can you talk to me about uh, doing your, your uh, do you do much spatial with panning? I or do. With... I do a little, I, I do some. Okay. Uh, obviously we're Would in- Do you like to do drums in different? Well, that's the thing. I mean, 
first you got to take into account of where we're at. Sure. And if you go too crazy with panning, then the person that's sitting up here in the, you know, in the nosebleed section might not hear, you know, the guitar solo if I haven't panned over yeah. here. So or the hi hats to, only over yeah, there. Yeah, so you have to be careful with that. So drums are usually around ten and two. I okay. try to stay in that area. Okay. I do want to. I do want a little bit of movement across. But also because of the way we have the PA configured, so you have left and right, and then you go to the side hangs, and you have right and left. So it's reversed. So those people are getting a little bit of movement in the stereo image. People over here on the sides. Yeah. So drums 10 and 2, uh, and then guitars, because I want the vocal to come right up the center, I do... I, I take guitars and pan left and right, and then I, I put 10 millisecond delay on one side. And so okay. that just kind of kicks it out a sure. little bit more. And, and then I have another guitar channel that comes up and fills up the center somewhat, and then David's vocal is just right there in the center of the mix. So I give it the spread so that the vocal can be present. I like stereo image live. Now, but you can't go too far because you have to worry about when it folds down to mono for the front fills. That you don't lose anything that you've panned too far left and right. So you always got to make sure that, that your mono source is good. Which is where the SPL big comes in because everything folds down to mono great. Because I'm not really spreading the whole image that much. Yeah. It's just a, it's a, just a little bit. Talk to me about how you make room for uh, different instruments. Because I, I, do you uh, start with a guitar and just listen to, to that? Because I know some engineers that will uh, say that the guitar by itself shouldn't sound good. It should sound good in the mix with everything uh, together. Talk to me a little bit about that and your mindset. With well, that's true. Because there's what's the point of soloing things? Because nobody's ever going to really hear it like that. But at the same time, I want to make sure that the individual inputs do sound good sure. before I blend them into everything else because it's going to make the end result just a little bit easier. Uh, so, you know, things like the guitar being too bright is going to interfere with the interfere with the vocals, or you know, if the bass has too much low end in it, it's going to cover up the kick drum. And so, when I'm putting stuff together, I mean, there's certain things that I always do to inputs. High and pass, it, low pass? High, high pass and low pass is everything, I think. After input, the next thing is high pass. Do you gate everything too? I gate the toms and snare bottom okay. and kick drums, okay. obviously. Snare top, I like to leave open okay. because obviously if they do some sort of light roll or something. Plus, another thing I hate about gates on snares is that when they hit the snare, then you get the psh, psh of the sim of the hi-hats all the time. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, cymbals and hi-hats are the, you know, that's the bane of our existence. It's like <laughs> trying to make sure you hear it, but it's not just too sibilant and, yeah. you know. But when it comes to putting it all together, I mean, I do listen to things individually somewhat to try and fine-tune it. And when I'm, when I'm doing the drums, obviously, I'm going to listen to things individually. But the end result of the drums are that I want to treat them as an entire instrument the drum even though it's whatever 16 inputs it's one instrument and that's how i like to treat it which is why grouping my like when i group the drums to a group there's going to be a little bit of compression and maybe a little bit of eq on the drum group after the compression to give it just an overall an overall uh you know balance and a and a, and a sound to the drum kit the same with the guitar sending it to a group, doing whatever's going to happen there, and then maybe a little bit of EQ if it needs it. A lot of, a lot of everything just get, getting bussed down to groups, and then the groups go into the mix bus. Sure. It's kind of the way that I, that I started my process a long time ago, and then I kind of gravitate towards doing everything the same sort of way every time. But I do listen to things individually okay. a lot. Okay. Uh, any parallel compression or any? Always parallel track? compression. Okay. Parallel compression, 
on pretty much everything, actually. It's on the drum really? group. Yes, and okay. there's parallel compression on the bass group as well, which I'm getting from the, from the, uh, from the Rupert Neve compressors. It's not a separate blend, okay. but it's happening in one stereo unit. Okay. I just like, to me, parallel compression is the way to make things move forward in a mix, and it's not about volume. Explain to new people, what is parallel compression? Well, so parallel compression, so let's, let's say we have our main drum group, which consists of, of kick, snare, hi-hat, toms, overheads. It's everything. So I want a little bit of light compression on the, in the entire drum kit to, to keep it together, followed by a little bit of EQ. The parallel drum group, I'm gonna put kick and snare and maybe toms. And I'm gonna squash the shit out of that. <laughs> and I want and I'm gonna I'm gonna control the transients, I'm gonna make it snappier. And when I start blending the parallel compressed drum kit in with the with the more or less unprocessed drum kit, all of a sudden you start the transients come alive and you start to get the snap. And the drum kit just seems to push forward. But it's not a it's a, not a matter of volume. It's that now I've just pushed this this process thing into the main drum group and just made the perceived loudness yeah. becomes more apparent. And again, treating it as one instrument. That's the, I think the premise of parallel compression is that you push things forward and it's not really a matter of volume. You're just giving things more weight sure. and, and pushing them into the image more. So what advice would you give to uh, engineers just now starting off? Or they're saying this and they want to be in your shoe one day. What advice would you give to them? I would say the biggest piece of advice is that just listen. Before anything else, before here's what I want to use, I want to use these plugins, I want to use this outboard gear, listen to what it is that you're about to mix and listen to the inputs. And listen how it all, that's like the biggest thing that I think a lot of people forget is that they get technical and they start turning knobs and doing this and that and they're looking and, okay, this is all what it's supposed to be. And then you listen and it's like, whoa, what, what doesn't sound cohesive. It doesn't sound like a, like a band, yeah. you know? That's like the biggest piece of advice. Forget about all the gear. You should be able to walk up to a 24 by eight Mackie with some Behringer comps <laughs> and gates and start dialing some things in and, and you know, have it sound like a band in the end. Yeah because that's what it's about. It's about the music. These are just the tools that we choose to use. The first, the most important thing is the music. I, Second most important thing is the listener. Because mm. without the listener, there's no music. I love it. I think that's, that's kind of my hard thing, especially digital, is that like, I'll be so, I'm so guilty of this, I'll be focused on how it looks, and I forget to look up and there's a band. It may not look great, but does it sound good? Um, and I try to teach that to guys I, I'm teaching with doing sound, like just listen. It's okay, just use those. Yeah. It's gonna be all right for it. Exactly. It may not be okay there, but it doesn't But sound here's good. the thing, when we were on an analog desk, you can't see EQ. You spin that knob, that's another thing. Best piece of advice, turn the knob until it sounds good. Do you spike it up and kind of sweep through to Sometimes hear the Sometimes I okay. do, okay. yeah. But you gotta be careful of that too, because anything that you spike up, when you cut it, it's going to sound better. That's so, actually a really good point. So you have That's to watch. That's a really good point. You have to watch sometimes. It's careful not to go too crazy. So if I do spike something up, before I start cutting, I'll come back to flat and listen again and make sure. And then That's I might good. do little cuts. That's good. Yeah, because I could jack any frequency up and you're going to be like, oh, that's awful. Well, sure. Because I just put 15 dB, it's like 3K <laughs> through something, you know? That's good. Yeah. And you know, something else that when you talk about looking and listening and looking up at the band, like there'll be nights when I'm, I'll become fixated on something that's just driving me insane. And it could be this minutest little thing. And then all of a sudden I'll be like, wait a minute. And I'll just push myself back from the console and I'll just look up and listen. And then I'll look at the audience. Hmm. And then I might get up and walk over and stand next to the people who are getting into it to try and move, remove myself from the, being a mixer 
to be in the audience. Mm. And it takes me out of the pers this, this perspective altogether. It puts me into another perspective. And then I'm like, that hi-hat sounds fine. <laughs> I'm going to leave that hi-hat alone. You know, but it's the, it's, it seems like the dumbest of things. But yeah. it took me a little bit to figure that one out, too. Is that just remove yourself for a minute and try to listen like the audience is. And if they're all screaming and yelling and jumping up and down and nobody has their fingers in their ears, you're probably doing okay. That, that, I like that. that that's, that's really good. And I can get really focused on those small details and realize that, you know, on, in all honesty, most of these people aren't going to notice the things that you and I right. or people here are going to notice. 99% of them are really going to like, wow, well, actually, looks really cool. Yep. You know what the audience notices? Wow. Yeah. That's really cool. That's really cool. I love it. Wow. I love the mix to that, too. I mean, that's killer. But I mean, most of the, I mean, I hate to say it like this, and it, I, most of them are wanna, can they hear the person? Can they feel the kick drum? And is that hot girl next to them? We're gonna talk to them at the end of the night. That's I it. Mean, it's just. Yeah, that's what the audience notices. I can't, I, I can't hear the vocal. It's muddy or it's harsh or it's too loud, not loud enough. It's basic things. Yeah. Nobody's gonna say, well, you know, the mix was okay, but that, that hi-hat, it really bothered me. Yeah. You know, it was too much 10K <laughs> on that hi-hat. <laughs> Or the snare bottom. I didn't get enough 3K yeah. out of that thing. I don't know. They don't notice those things. Yeah. They don't. What do you think separates a good engineer from a great engineer? Hmm. I'd say being able to take what's put in front of you and turn it into something. No matter what the gear is. I like it. So if people want to follow you, uh, where can they follow you at? There's Fixin' to Get Mixin' Instagram, okay. Facebook, YouTube, website, or Brad Divins. And Brad Divins is on Fixin' to Get Mixin', is on uh, Instagram and Facebook as well. Okay. Or so, but it's Fixin' to Get Mixin'. Or at a disturbed show or Enrique Iglesias show near you. Exactly. Matt, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. I'm looking forward to uh, listening to some Yeah, of you're welcome. Awesome.